Good day, Nick. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today. Before we get started into my questions, could you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and share with us your background in the L&D biz? Sure. Um, it goes back, you know, quite a way. Uh, I, I currently uh, am the HRD for Talent and Learning for Deloitte in the UK, which is effectively the Chief Learning Officer for Deloitte. Prior to that, I was actually in another of the, the big six consultancy firms in a client facing role where I set up and ran the learning innovation um, service line. Before that, I was at BP um, and led online and informal learning there. The acronym always worried me, you know, with, with OIL as your acronym, you're always concerned someone will ring you at the middle of the night and, and ask you to help out with uh, um, putting a fire out. But thankfully, that never happened. Um, prior to that, I was at the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, um, and um, where I kind of headed up the, the digital innovation stuff we were doing. And uh, before that, I was too far back now, isn't it? I was at Siemens, um, Siemens Communications for five years. Before that, I was part of a startup. And before that, I spent five years as a psychology lecturer and published psychology textbooks. Um, and if I go back even further, I actually went to a Quaker boarding school, um, you know, which, which uh, for those of you listening, is a little bit like Hogwarts. You know, it's very sort of lots of oak staircases and curious practices. Um, so, yeah, that's that's me. Well, thank you for that introduction. That reminded me of when I read your book, you talked about green trainers. And I didn't yeah. understand what the word trainers meant. Now I understand it's, it's running shoes, uh, track shoes or something like that. Uh, but I remember that throwing me some of your uh, stories in, in, in your earlier book. Um, well, let's move on to the main event here. So you've uh, left Deloitte and you're starting your own consulting firm. So uh, share with us a little bit about, you know, so what is that all about? Who are you targeting? Uh, what kinds of products and services are you going to render to the marketplace? Sure. Um, so I guess a lot of my work throughout my career has been helping organizations to move away from, you know, things like education and training that, that demonstrably weren't making a difference so organizations often have this feeling they're kind of going through the motions with their training and education stuff and they're not seeing the impact they want towards learning towards actually learning and performance support things that make a measurable impact on performance build people's capability and actually you know a, a great experiences for people and so a lot of my work has been in those two areas and so we have a really clear mission um, which is to measurably improve the performance and experience of employees. And you'll notice that kind of learning drops out of that equation. Learning is a kind of a, in some cases, a means to an end, but we should never lose sight of that's what we're really trying to achieve. We're trying to improve performance or we're trying to improve experience. And experience is really important for organizations right now. So that's the mission for uh, Shackleton Consult Consulting. Um, there are a bunch of services that go into that, everything from you know, facilitation, inspiration sessions, all the way through up to kind of program design and delivery and, and strategy and transformation and digital. Those are all things that I've done and advised you know, household names on. Um, but for people who are interested, there's plenty more on shackleton-consulting.com, which is, is the website that I built to tell people about um, the new business. Yes, I will be sure to put that uh, URL in the show notes here uh, on YouTube. Thanks, sir. Um, so how are you, uh, how do you see yourself? I, I know you do this. You're differentiating yourself from others. Uh, you know, you're, I think, uh, somewhat famous for, you know, resources versus courses. But yeah. uh, so, so, you know, tell us more about how you're, you're going to be different in, in terms of what you do than than a lot of the uh, learning and development vendors that are out there as you compare and contrast yourself. Sure. Um, perhaps I can do it by way of a, of a short story. Um, as I say, I started out as a psychology lecturer um, and that was about the time of the birth of the internet, if you can believe that. Um, and so I was a psychology lecturer who became fascinated by HTML and Flash and sort of taught myself those skills. Um, and I, I guess I was probably one of a handful of individuals at the time who had a really kind of deep understanding of psychology, but also of the, the, the nascent technology. And I thought, you know, I'm going to change the world. I'm probably one of a few people who really understand 
you know, learning theory and psychology and really and really understand sort of technology. And so I had an opportunity with Siemens. They gave me some budget and they get a team, in fact, um, to actually build the, I guess, the next generation, as I saw it, of, of learning technologies. And, and we set about that. And, and I think it was hubris. Looking back, you know, I, I thought we were building things which were, you know, 30 years ahead of what people are building today, you know, sort of AI driven, narrative driven, scenario based simulation, um, you know, type stuff that we were building even back then. This is kind of 25 years ago. And I thought this is so much better than anything anyone's doing. We'll, we'll prove it. You know, we'll do an experiment. And, and so we took our whizzy, you know, all singing, all dancing, you know, pr program and we compared it in a number of experimental conditions with people who are just reading a piece of text, right? Like you would in Notepad. And then we, we check recall, you know, and, and guess what? It didn't make a damn bit of difference. And I realized, you know, 25 years ago that we were kidding ourselves, that we'd invented a, a whole world of educational rituals and instructional design that wasn't really making a difference. And, and that doubt gnawed away at me. And, um, uh, and some people I think are content with that. Now, you know, you might challenge that and you might say, Look, you, you can't tell me, Nick, that all this instructional design is just bunk. You know, it's plenty of research. But, you know, imagine that you were investigating kind of a cure for cancer. And the way that you did that was you painted rooms different colors and you found that there was a marginal difference. You know, if people were in a blue room, you know, they were a little bit likely likelier to recover. You, you, the point is that that would still be experimental, it would still be research, but you, you wouldn't have fundamentally understood what it was you were, you were trying to tackle. So I, I went in search of that fundamental understanding of learning. I realized that we didn't have one. And so it took me probably two decades to really figure out how it is that people learn. And I wrote a book um, called How People Learn. <laughs> I uh, published it. And it's something called the Effective Context Model. Um, and that provides the first, I think, general theory of learning and a solid foundation on which to do two kinds of things. You can either build useful stuff for people. You can build performance support. Or you can design experiences, experiences which build capability, which change people, um, uh, and 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 which move a, a learning proper. You know, really building their capability through through learning. So that I guess was a differentiator for me, and I began to see more and more that there were organisations stuck in an educational ritual. We've all been to school. We all know how that works. You know, somebody who doesn't care too much about us, who doesn't know our name, doesn't know what matters to us you know, has a bunch of stuff that they want to kind of push out. And I call that content dumping. And the problem for many of us, and, and those people listening to this podcast, most of you will be learning and development professionals, is we are approached by our business and by people in our business who've been through that model and expect us to do the same. They say, look, here's a manual, here's some stuff, here's some content, here's a topic. But it didn't work terribly well at school and it doesn't work terribly well in our businesses, but people don't know what else to do. So my contribution to the industry has been to show that there are two alternative things that you can do. One which people are familiar with and is not kind of exclusively me. I mean, performance support, the other, you know, experience design, but to build both those things from a solid foundation, as I say, of really understanding learning. Thank you. Um, so my next question is, uh, what's the measurable impact you hope to achieve uh, with this approach to learning and development and performance. Um, and perhaps maybe you can share an example from your background where you were successful in doing that. So, you know, how do you measure your impact? And can you share a story about doing that? Sure. So there are two approaches and people don't always get that. You know, you mentioned, you know, resources, not courses. Those organizations who, and, and you know this only to well, Guy, are looking for performance improvement, performance impact, will be well advised to look at performance consulting and actually building guides and checklists. And this is territory which is, you know, well covered experimentally. You know, if you haven't read Atul Gawende's book, um, The Checklist Manifesto, he found that a simple checklist could have more impact on performance than two weeks worth of training. Um, so, but the thing about that, the thing that a lot of people don't get is that that isn't fundamentally anything to do with learning. You know, you might even call it learning elimination. Effectively, it's a technique for taking knowledge out of people's heads and putting it in externally in a way which improves their performance. And that's a really powerful thing for organizations to do. But sometimes you don't want to do that. 
And, and actually, there's a really lovely illustration from Atul Gwanda himself. His approach was very effective in the book. But when some other organizations tried to apply it, they found that sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And the times it didn't work is when people just didn't care enough to use the performance support. So that has to go hand in hand with actually building capability and what I would call concern. You know, something has to really matter for you to look it up. That's why we look things up on Google, because it matters to us, right? So in many organizations, that's more the challenge is how do you build an experience around diversity, um, around inclusion, around safety, around data protection, which really changes the, the way people feel about something, makes them care, makes them use the performance support, or even the kind of a simulation that builds their capability. And so that's the latter area, kind of experience design. So I can give examples of both, um, you know, but an example of the latter, I was um, contacted in my, in my previous role, um, client facing work by a, a global organization who was selling a fast moving consumer good that was changing. It was going from, from one type of product to a radically different digital product. And they tried trading and the training hadn't worked. Um, and they wanted to take every executive team in every market in the world through a program which would help transform the organization for this new world. So what we did was we built a series of experience, eight weeks of experiences, um, and they were modeled on those parts of the organization that had gone through this transformation, encountered challenges and learned from them. And so we modeled these simulated experiences and they went through these experiences one after the um, other for kind of eight weeks. An example of an experience was, you know, meeting your new customers. They, they were going to have to as business deal with different customers. So we got actors. We briefed them against market data. We walked them into the room and we had the executives try and sell the new product and they couldn't sell it. And they realized something at that point that, you know, they, they had to change their mindset and their thinking. So that was an example of a, an experience design program, an eight week program of experiences designed to transform that business. And it did. They rolled that out globally as a transformation academy. And it had a measurable impact in the sense that, that you, could, you could actually see the market success in actually transforming as a result of whether or not their executives had been through that experience. So not only did it score very highly on a net, net promoter score measure, it was very different much more impactful than training, but it directly correlated with their success in actually transitioning their market. So um, that, that I think was a, a kind of lovely example of how experienced uh, design can really you know, bring transformation to life. Thank you for that uh, example. Yeah, I, I, I love hearing this kind of stuff. So can you share with us, you know, so you, you've been in the business for a while that you're a fairly well-known name, uh, uh, probably more so in Europe than in America. But so what are your clients and prospects saying to you about your your shift into this new business? What kind of reaction are you getting? <laughs> well, it's been over. It's just I've been bowled over by the level of support. I think it had some, it, it, something like 20,000 or kind of, you know, views of, of the, the launch communication and 500 comments and hundreds of people expressing support. I, I'm really grateful, frankly. I'm a somewhat reluctant entrepreneur. I encounter a lot of very kind of gung-ho entrepreneurs, uh, you know, looking to make a lot of money. It's not really my motivation. I'm passionate about what I do. And um, I just want to be able to do exciting, groundbreaking work with, with people who share that passion, really. So um, I, I perhaps, a, a reluctant, as I say, a reluctant entrepreneur, but I have been buoyed, uh, to use the nautical metaphor, by the support that um, I've had from, from that community, especially on LinkedIn. So I'm very grateful. Excellent. Yeah, I can now. I've got a visual of you bobbing up and down in the ocean here. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything that uh, you'd like to add before we wrap up? Um, no, I, I, I don't think so. I guess that I probably ought to kind of plug the book and the website. You know, I feel you know duty bound. So how people learn. You know, I'm, I'm just. Uh, uh, it's been a very successful book, and Kogan Page have asked me to write the next version of it. So I'm kind of hard at work doing that. Um, but yeah, available on Amazon, whatever. Um, and if you want to better understand what I do and the, the services that I provide, then by all means, um, visit Shackleton Consulting at shackleton-consulting.com. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk to people, um, especially about learning. And, and when's this uh, second edition of the book coming out? Uh, I think my deadline is March next year. So okay. yeah, I guess it will be as... 
according so to their worthwhile for people to buy it. the current version and then, and then <laughs> <laughs> well I, I i'll leave that up to people's best judgment but um yeah i mean if you don't want to wait then well i I, I enjoyed that first book and so i'll i'll be looking forward to seeing the next one come out um nick thanks so much for uh sharing with us today and uh good luck with and best wishes in your new uh venture thank you thank you very much thanks for having me on Thanks, guys.